Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Secrets of the Sire. We do this every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, talkradio.nyc, and streaming live on facebook.com slash secrets of the sire and youtube.com slash secrets of the sire as always i'm your host mike dolce uh tonight we are partying like it's 1999 we are talking matrix 20 year anniversary yeah, i know it's been 20 years oh my god uh and we're gonna uh be able to give you our amazing macy gray interview um with the unbelievable uh music talent i am joined as always by my cohort in crime mr hassan godwin how you doing sir no, I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. Well, thank that's you for thank you, America, for having us. That's uh, that's half the battle, right? Um, yeah. No, knowing is half the battle. <laughs> knowing and showing I think, up is the war. Knowing is half the battle. Okay, so this is what I want to know. Uh, we're gonna do a cool retro review because I think retro reviews are pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll ask we'll ask the question, of course. Does it still hold up? I think the answer is obviously yes, right? I mean, I don't think well, I don't think we. I don't think we have to. I don't think we're spoiling anything by being like, "Yeah, it's still a great movie." Um, but first, can you believe well, it's been twenty years? Yes. <laughs> so it feels. <laughs> yes, yes, I had because it's been. I felt every one of those uh, twenty years. But actually, no. It's a. I, that's substantial. The yeah. Matrix is, it's actually odd without even getting into the movie just yet, but it is odd because it is the future, but it's a very it's it's. It's amazingly dated for how ahead of its time it is, just in the accessories. Like, yeah. if you look at those phones, sure, you're like, yeah, that's the 90s, man. I mean, it's a very 90s movie, Yeah, even though it's at the exact end of the 90s. Right. It's very 90s-centric. So you can kind of feel it. Isn't it funny, too? Like, I, that's the one thing that I always hate, right? Or like, uh, you know, things like Star Wars, too, where you have to now explain why things look a little dated, like... Um, you know, because they didn't have the foresight to see, you know, where we were going or the future itself. I always have this belief, like we're patterning the future over, you know, off of movies that looked really cool to whoever these people are that are inventing all this cool stuff that we're doing now. So, um, but yeah, I agree with you. There's, there are elements to it where you're like, all right, yeah. You know, here's the funny thing well, about the nineties. Not, not as many people wear leather anymore. No. Um, <laughs> you know. Only the cool kids still wear sunglasses, but I mean that's oh you know, oh that's... yeah where's oh yeah wait oh woo. yeah yeah what's going on woo -hoo -hoo! Okay. there you go this is actually not there for your not... benefit this is for 1999 uh, Keanu Reeves yeah. party but now it's I ruined now the visual I ruined the visual I gotta you know I gotta be honest with you I'm looking at myself on screen here and I'm like this is a good look like I just need to do this every week <laughs> I don't know why I'm not now you now you understand my point yeah don't you. <laughs> Um, and now I won't be able to see your eyes roll every time I say something stupid. I, but I'm, I'm Italian, so I talk with my entire body. So I'd be like, Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> like, and that's me being subtle. Like, you know, you'll say something, I'll be like, Ugh. yeah, <laughs> so I know. You'll, you'll, just, yeah, you'll just know. You don't, you don't have a lot of uh, emotional subtle. So, but, as, uh, right. Aside from, aside from the obvious, you know. Things that are things that don't belong, you know, and what what here doesn't belong anymore in terms of the future. Um, you know, what else about the movie that just that does hold up that is, you know, so ahead of its time? I don't know if it, I don't know if hold up is the right word. It's just it really hasn't been topped yet. You know, that first yeah. movie. Um, we, we don't have to talk about the other. Well, the other two haven't reached their 20-year anniversaries yet, so we don't have to talk about them. But um, it's it's an amazingly stylized movie. It's 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 incredibly well told. It's very well thought out. Very very intricate. Very tight uh, mythology that's being utilized there. Actually, the only really dated thing about it is the are those phones, right. which are you know they're kind of glaring because of how phones have become. So so integral right. to our lives, but they were ahead of their time in predicting that the phone would be the that you could use your your cell phone sure to to interact and to into you know uh, uh, to engage online yeah and 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 do important incredible things. They didn't see how far it was going to go. They didn't think they didn't realize your phone would be your computer yeah essentially. But but that's the only thing they kind of did not predict. 
Well, um, you know, here's here's the good thing, right? Like in terms of predicting, it's set in 1999. You know what I mean? So it's not necessarily a, a you know this is the future kind of thing, even though there is the future. Um, no. and, and they can get away with anything by because when you actually do see the future, it's this desolate wasteland that's you know that that that's been you know, uh, you know yeah. destroyed because of the nukes and this and that. You know, so there's there is uh, pretty, pretty dystopian, yeah. Right, it's right. It's amazing. No, that's that's the words I'm looking for. See, now we've had snow days here in the Northeast, and my kids have been yeah. home the last two days, and um, and it was two hour delay today. So brain fuzzy, bad, dystopian, so, dystopian. What yes. what a fantastic word. To describe snow everything days, I was trying to snow very – Snow days <laughs> Very like – Vocabulary. I yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's – I mean that's essentially that, – that absolutely is something that um, you look at this. What it did for movies though in general, I mean we're still, we're still feeling it today, um, which is why I kind of want to ask the question, you know, Matrix versus Star Wars in a second. Uh, be, not necessarily to pit the two of them against each other because it's, it's, it's mm. like saying uh, – the Matrix was – well, definitely for me because I wasn't alive during the first Star Wars. It was our Star Wars. You know, It was, it was, the, it was the movie that changed movie making. That slow motion, every single movie you watch has the – you know, like slow motion, bullet time, you know, all this other stuff. I mean it literally from a visual standpoint changed the way you do movies and it also changed um, – you know, They weren't the first to do that though, by the way. I know you said this before, but I think it was the first one. If you asked anybody off the street, I know, say, I know, but they would be wrong if they said that was the first. I'm right. just saying. I'm not saying it's not significant. I think they right. they stylized it to a point where it became it became part of the the, the zeitgeist of you know of post. I don't know what you would. I don't even know how you would describe it. Post well, it, modern. It's funny you mentioned that. Um, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because you said like, "Oh, this is a um, this is a like a '90s movie," and I'm like thinking to myself, "I'm like, no, actually, it's really not. Like, it's '99, so it really is on that cusp. The '90s to it me is on the verge of the the new new, new millennium. Yeah, you know. Yeah, the '90s to me, as much as I know, it's one. It's funny because you could say the '80s, right? And mm-hmm. and to me, if you say the '80s, it is the entire decade. Like the '80s had, like the '80s lasted for an entire decade. <laughs> the '90s were cut into like two parts, and maybe that's the music, maybe that's the pop culture aspect to it. I'm not sure. Yeah. The music obviously playing such a huge role in in what you would define as the '90s. But you had the first half of the '90s, which was all grunge, which was flannel. Um, you had hip hop breaking out too. So you had a lot of the Oakland Raiders hats. You had a lot of, I mean, that's that's the that's the first that's that's the '90s part one. The 90s part two is this like leather look, this futuristic look, this Y2K thing where, you know, yeah. all of a sudden everyone's kind of like, oh, snap, we're going to make it to 2000. We might not make it after 2000, but we're making yeah. it to 2000. Because the world's going to end from Y2K. And, so and, we're, we're going to get just to 2000. And yeah. It's all going to be over. And as much as the phone revolutionized everything, and it has, um, mm-hmm. and, and to a much more, uh, a, a much higher degree. You know, you started having internet in everyone's home in the second part of the 90s. You know, Prodigy yeah. was a thing in 94, but then come like 96, 97, you know, that's when you have people using dial-up and using it effectively. That's the message board culture that has that has infected, and I'm going to use that term, uh, our yeah. entire culture now because of social media. Uh, it started there. Those chat rooms started there, and everything started there uh, with that particular, um, you know, era. Yeah, so to me, it's – to me, it's '90s Part Two, um, and it's—I mean, what a yeah. great film to have to be like the capper, right? '90s the sequel. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a good way. It's it's better than the '60s ended because the '60s ended with Altamont. So yeah. at least uh, at least the '90s ended with yeah. um, uh, with uh, the Matrix. That's a good way to usher out that that, uh, uh, in my opinion, an amazing decade. Yeah, that's a good way to 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 end it. Yeah. Um, but all I'm saying is they weren't the first people to do bullet time. No. Uh, just, it's, it's great good timing, though, <laughs> because bullet time just flashed across the screen. For anyone watching us on YouTube.com slash Secrets of the Sire, please chime in. We love to get well, comments. Facebook.com slash Secrets nice of the Sire. We love getting all that stuff. Uh, all right. As for the, the bare bones of the film itself, right, um, hmm. from a structure point of view, I think it's still solid. I mean, everything about it is still solid to me. Um, there was no, There's nothing glaring in it. Uh, that um, stands out to me and and stood out to me back then. You know, we have a habit now of really 
you know, hyper exercising the the minute detail, like oh, this didn't work, and this didn't work, and this didn't work, and this didn't work. You know, there's there's obviously look, there's obviously some things that don't work in the film, but for the most part, I think everything works in the film. I mean, what do you think? Like what? What do you think? What do you think doesn't work? Let's just start there. What do, what do you think doesn't work? Because because basically everything else does work. Right? I, I think, so. What do you think? I, the 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 Jesus Christ moment at the end was always kind of a stretch. It was always a little bit of a, a and I don't mean that because he came back, just in terms of. Um, the resurrection in general. Yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah. It was, and, and again, this is this is my like. I'm I'm literally like you know you're finding like a little bit of a of a crack in the Mona Lisa you know upper right hand corner kind of thing. I mean, I think it's a I think it's a pretty. I'm not gonna use the word perfect movie because it's not the right word that I'm looking for, but there is just it, it's just something so solid and engaging, and then at the same time mind blowing, right? I mean, like right. you you take away all the special effects. Which are tremendous. You take away the, the the martial arts, which is unbelievable. The combination of all that stuff, right? And you just get down to a story, and it's like, huh? So that's a different spin on the Terminator story. It has it borrows some elements from Terminator with the you know the nuclear apocalypse and you know machines taking over and AI and this and that. But it's like, okay, it's set in a Terminator universe, not continuity for all you internet people ready to jump on me. But it but it basically it it gives you that. Uh yeah okay yeah, oh right. this is a this is a, this is a different spin on a, something I've seen before. Skynet was very successful. That's, right. That's, that's basically what we were meant to think. Right. While watching it. Right and and but it but it gives us something that that Terminator. Well, I mean Terminator did, but in two different time time zones or timelines, however you want to call it. Um, it it, it theoretically sets it in present day, right? I mean, it theoretically is like you can go on living as if. Nothing has ever, you know, you can go living your life or you can choose to realize that that nagging feeling you had that that life kind of sucks for some reason. Well, yeah, there's a reason. And and that and that's why, you know, so so to me, yeah. it, it connects to modern day, I think, in a way that um, Terminator just can't do um, simply because you're trying to prevent this as opposed to, OK, you, you actually are in this. Right. Right. There's also this weird. um there's, there's this really strange uh, story within the story yeah. about not so, not, not so much about freedom, because the story is definitely about freedom and about uh, being having your own agency, being the master of your own destiny, sure. that kind of thing. Not wanting to be li- live life as a battery. I, I understand. You right. Know, you can get that. But um, this, is the, this is one of the first times where it shows you that the system, this, this, this hated yeah. device, the system, is actually – Actually, also offering you something. Yeah, it's the first. It's the first time that they've actually managed to describe why there are people who are devoted to the system. Right. Because the system is giving you all these presents. You know, yeah. The system is giving you a great life, even that, even if it is a delusion. Yeah. And when you become free, you notice, like in a, which you know is more apparent in the uh, in the. In the in the much maligned second and third uh, yeah, installment yeah. of the mm-hmm. matrix, you find out freedom isn't really that great. You know, everybody's living underground and right, you know, in, in this, in this kind of, in this horrible subterranean wasteland. And it's, it was always cold, you know, and they're, everyone's dressed in like rags and, you know, they have rave parties, but that's about all the only <laughs> like joy that you see. So, well, no, no, you didn't, so, you didn't know at that point that they had rave parties. All right. no, Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say we got we're, we're actually bumping up against commercial. I'm gonna let you finish your point when we come back. But I'm just I'm yeah. just saying that it's just it's just the first time that you get in this in that in that uh, genre uh-huh. of fight the system. You know, like the Robin Hood genre of mm-hmm. fighting. You know, fighting the system. You get to see why people would choose the other side. You know, it, yeah. it showed you. It makes you wonder. Like, well, why would you want to wake up? You yeah. know, <laughs> it's so. I, I I'll, I'll confess in that. if I was given the choice between red blue pill and blue pill. Blue pill. When baby. <laughs> we come back, we'll ask that question to Joan and Priya from Follow Me Friday on Talking Alternative. We'll see you very very shortly. <laughs> Michael Keaton. 
Joel Chapin, creator of the Suicide Belt from 1960. The Suicide is about a superhero forced by his own costume to fight evil. It's like having the fighter sense that instead of warning you of danger, it actually puts him in danger. It was first launched back in 2006 through After Hours Press and was met with tremendous success. Six issues and a trade paperback later, I thought the sire's journey had reached a good stopping point. But a funny thing happened. As I continued working in comics, writing for Xenoscope and co-creating Descendant for Image Comics, fans would meet me at conventions and continually ask when the next issue was coming out. Apparently, the sire was far from done. And that's why I'm pr proud to welcome you to this Kickstarter, celebrating the Volume 2 trade paperback for the Sire. Collecting issues 7 through 10 and featuring an amazing cover by Jim Califuri of Aquaman fame. The trade is an exciting way for readers, both new and old, to get into the character. And this trade doesn't just collect old material. It's jam-packed with almost 15 pages of new material. Welcome back to Secrets of the Sire. Again, we do this every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, talkradio.nyc. We're talking Matrix Retro Review. It's been 20 years since the groundbreaking film. Um, and before we get to our guests, i got to throw this out there, Hassan. Uh, bigger impact, Star Wars or Matrix? What do you think? Uh, <laughs> I would say for, for that era? Yeah. It would have to be the Matrix. I, for I don't. That era. I actually don't disagree with you. I because actually don't. Because it came along and it put, and it was able to compete with Star Wars, which was a uh, you know which nothing else could really do. Yeah. Of course, of course, Star Wars is bigger than the Matrix, but yes. You know, oh, absolutely. You know. No, absolutely. I don't think there's yeah. any disagreement on that. All right, I'm gonna welcome our guests for tonight. We've got Joan. We've got Priya. Hey. Uh, hello. Oh, hello. hello. And uh, <laughs> we've got sunglasses galore, which is always a good thing. So it's that's Matrix night. It is Matrix <laughs> night. It's it, it's Matrix night in the uh, in the Dolce household, and uh, and everybody is everybody's participating. So that's a good thing. <laughs> and Priya, got to. Priya is now back on screen because uh, I didn't have it. I knew it. Technical difficulties gone. All right. 1999, ladies, where, well, first of all, tell everyone about your awesome show uh, on Talking Alternative Broadcasting, where they can find it and what it's about. Awesome. Take it off, Jody. It's Follow Me Friday with Joan and Priya, globally connecting thought leaders in a fun and educational way on talkradio.nyc. <laughs> oh, baby. All right. Well, that's exciting. We got it down. Our website is joanandpriya.com. Oh, well, check it out. Check it out. All right, yeah. so 1999. Uh, we, don't, we do not have our stick together that tightly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think you're, 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 Asad, you're basically just like, uh, Mike, take care of that shtick thing. I'm going to be right here. Get your shtick down. And, uh, yeah, and that's it. I think that's it. All right. Yeah, that's pretty much. That's what we went over. What, what do you ladies think about The Matrix? What kind of in, impact? Joan, you actually have a really funny story about that, uh, it, where you were in 99 in regards to The Matrix. So this copy of The Matrix, I've oh, had for a is. long time. So 1999, I was in acting school at New Actors Workshop, mm -hmm. and I was doing promotional work. I was asked to dress up in pleather, which is now <laughs> called vegan leather. Ah, okay. <laughs> I still call it pleather. <laughs> a bar in Hoboken, New Jersey, dressed up as The Matrix to talk about The Matrix, give out tickets, it was a beer promo. I don't even, I think it was Budweiser. And we gave out tickets and we gave out DVDs of the movie. <laughs> so you were you were actively involved in the Matrix. You were in the Matrix at that point. I was yeah. in the Matrix. But let me ask you the most important question. Did you see the movie? Of course. Everybody's <laughs> seen that movie. Are you oh kidding? God. I no, I mean I mean like at the time, like when you were handing stuff out in Pleather. Yeah, when, I had you were selling it. Right. <laughs> She, she yeah. had to do her research. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Totes my goats. Okay. Yeah. Like, were, you, were you doing the action moves? The like, you know yeah, how they like bend? We had to act badass. We really, <laughs> yeah, like we had to kind of act like it was really tight pleather. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't cold though, right? No. Uh, at least it was at. It was hot. No. 
that's even worse. Yeah. I don't know what's, what's worse, cold skin tight leather or hot skin tight leather. Hot. Yeah, definitely right. hot. hot. I don't skin. think there's any question about that. It's definitely hot skin. Pl- 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 you can't take it off. I'm sweating like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> so you suffered. You suffered for the film. I suffered for the art. You suffered for the film. Okay. Did it. you so, enjoy the film? Did you? I, you... I absolutely love. We were talking about this, Priya and I, earlier. We. I loved that movie. I still love that movie. It was so like you couldn't even fathom what it was that they were doing it was so ahead of its time yeah the graphics were amazing and i think it really like set set the precedence for movies after that i think yeah. just that yeah. one little move that i was talking about where you're like bending <laughs> all yeah. the way yeah <laughs> coming you have to that, yeah you that got one it. little graphic right there was like blowing everybody away but then that's why I think, Hassan, you're absolutely right when you say it's actually, I think, more influential for its time because, you know, Star Wars definitely upped the ante for special effects as a whole. Um, I think you can, you can look at the, uh, you know, the TIE fighting scenes, um, even though those were kind of borrowed from like the 1940s uh, World War II, you know, flight scenes. So it's not like as if uh, George Lucas completely invented something, you know, out of nowhere. Uh, you had sword fighting, but it was, it was you know, Star Wars as as a look, as an aesthetic, um, you know, was borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and is still borrowed to this day. But Matrix as a filmmaking device, like devices in filmmaking, like I don't think, I don't think, I don't think there's any question. Like it's more influential the, than, the, in, on movies the, and still being the, influenced. The unfortunate thing about it is that its influence was ripped off so so blatantly that. They, it, right. it deadened the impact of the influence in the in the sequels. Right. So, whereas, yeah, it, that one movie was more influential than probably anything we had seen in the last like yep. twenty years mm-hmm. before it. So but the problem is, it was it was so it was so co opted. It so became part of of the zeitgeist so so fast that it it didn't it wasn't able to grow. Into the into a into a trilogy, kind of yeah. like Star Wars was. You know, like you couldn't rip Star Wars off without being a Star Wars ripoff. But because the Matrix is ninety percent action, yeah, you could you could rip the Matrix off and people and people still devoured it. You know, they they just loved the the um, the fluidity of the action. Well, but I think was, I think you're right. I think Star Wars was a world builder. Star Wars yeah. was a world builder versus Matrix, which tried to be a world builder. Um, but ultimately, just again, change the way you, the delivery of the movie gets made. Yeah, you you didn't see too many other intricate stories like that. You didn't see like things with uh, with like these these amazing mythologies that were mysteries to to kind of crack open and then kind of yeah. change the way you looked at the world. You didn't see too many ripoffs of that. You just saw a lot of slow motion and wire work. Mm-hmm. So that's that's unfortunate. Priya, you were gonna say something. No, I was just, I don't know if I agree with you guys in terms no. of. Oh, okay. Oh, well, okay. Star Wars okay. And- cut, cut her off. I will mute her. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> Boom. <Yeah. laughs> um, so, so, okay. Matrix was fantastic. It was a beast on its own. It, it really set a precedence for graphics and movie making and storyline. But Star, Star Wars has been around forever. And the Star Wars story is still going. Matrix ended. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't continued. So until, until they come out with Matrix Four, influence <laughs> ended. Unless they bring Neo back, you know, like unless they revitalize him and the machines bring him back. I don't know. They're talking. They're talking That's about been, it. Yeah, they've been talking about that for. It, it, it was as as. Uh, yeah, but John Wick is is making that all a reality again. Can we? You know, actually, Hassan, you bring up a great point though. Like, I don't like John Wick that much. <laughs> no, no, but like, but how amazing the fact is that Keanu Ke- Reeves is still, you know, is is still going strong. He's still a, a bankable powerhouse. But how amazing is that? That real. the reinvention of Keanu Reeves? Because I mean, Keanu Reeves started in the '80s with Bill and Ted's. Yeah, he three times. Huge he's, again he's, with uh, with Speed. Then you you kind of forgot about him. Don't forget, Will Smith was supposed to be Neo. It was not supposed right. to be Keanu Reeves. Oh, he was. Yeah, yeah Will he Smith turned it, was. He turned it down. He turned it down. He was, well, Men in Black had just come out, come out, right? So there was that, and I think I think he chose Wild Wild West over that. Is that the? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which didn't do well either. Is that the, and it wasn't. It didn't do well because it didn't deserve to. To be <laughs> honest, it was not good. In um, my personal opinion, but yeah. um, I like the song. 
But uh, anyway. Um, yeah, could you imagine? Could you imagine if Will Smith was in Matrix? Wait, could you imagine if Will Smith was in Matrix? There would have to be a Will Smith rap in the Matrix somewhere. Maybe like, there would have to be. Oh, that would have messed it up. Maybe they could have stopped him. They might have stopped him. Or you would have. Maybe you would have got some really awesome rock rap thing. You know, yeah. like with acid rock and. No, they you know. they would have been playing his music during that scene where the underground like doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That would have been funny. So Matrix, <laughs> from a cultural standpoint, huge, absolutely Matrix, huge. Matrix is amazing because I was I was in the theater watching the Matrix and watching Keanu Reeves do kung fu, and I was loving it. Yeah, and that's what's amazing about the Matrix. Keanu Reeves is 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 is, is fighting Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, in kung fu, and it's not a joke. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a punch that's that's a setup to a punchline. Yeah, but it actually is in the movie, and it's not a and everybody takes that scene seriously now. That but, that alone talks of shows the influence of the Matrix. But and I'm gonna throw this out uh, to our guests. What I'm gonna what? throw this out to Joan first. No Was it the highest grossing film of the year? That's a good question. I don't think so. You're you're onto something there. It was actually the fifth. So. Highest grossing film. And, well, that's uh, the year Phantom Menace came out. And that's so. exactly what's on screen right now, actually, too, for everyone streaming us on YouTube.com slash Secrets of the Sire yeah. and Facebook.com of the same <laughs> URL. Um, and it actually – it came in – ninety. you know, people talk about the 80s being a great time for movies, in it, and it is. But I think just the fact that music, um, I think, overshadows it so much. Uh, I, the 90s for movies is amazing, too. Episode one was the highest grossing film. You know, the number two was The Sixth Sense, which is an amazing, really? an amazing yeah. film, 1999. Oh, my God. Toy Story. I haven't been able to recover from that since. Then. I know. <laughs> Toy Story 2 was number three. Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, which is actually a pretty subpar sequel. Um, then you've got a couple, like you got Tarzan and you got Big Daddy. Brendan Fraser was killing it this year. Uh, <laughs> number eight was The Mummy. Then you had Runaway Bride. And then number 10, which I forgot all about this, Blair Witch Project was number 10. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Which she was, yeah. like, her nose. Remember her nose was running? <laughs> that, was <laughs> like, <laughs> that was a meme before memes existed. <laughs> that was like you used to, like, hit pause on your – on your TV and make funny comments about it. <laughs> you know, like that's what that's what that is. Oh boy. Right? So that's it's Oh boy. And what movie in 1999 won the Academy Award? I oh. know this because because we 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 discussed it. So uh, I'll I'll give this to Hassan. <laughs> oh no. I don't know. It starred a a Batman no more. Yeah. And it oh. starred – her head was in a box. What? Oh, no. It wasn't that movie. I'm saying it starred oh. it start the actress whose head ended up in a box in uh, – in, um, Oh, what was that? Uh, that is that Ben seven. Affleck seven. and Gwyneth Paltrow? Uh, that is correct. Was that the movie with her – where her husband died in the plane? Seven? No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, it's it a, is. Ben not, Affleck wasn't in, in seven. It is. It was a movie where her husband died in a plane, and then he came to to try to help her out, and they ended up falling in love. There's you. You got half the title. I. Shakespeare I in love. It. What? What? Yep. That is. That so won the funny. Academy Award. That did. I didn't even. Uh, that wasn't even one of my. Um, that wasn't even one of my mental choices. That yeah. always baffles me. Why do they choose movies? That oh, we, we, anybody <laughs> see win these awards. We went over that. It's 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 so absolutely if, has nothing to do with reality. You'd be you'd be astonished if you go you'd on be iTunes. Astonished the process and download our podcast. The last two weeks we've talked <laughs> all about it. All right, Joan and Priya, it has been awesome having you on. We're going to be bumping Aww, up against commercial thank you for break. Having us, guys. Tell yeah. all of our listeners where they can uh, listen to you as well. You can listen to us. Um, go to joanandpriya.com and uh, find us, and you can find us on social media too. And our show is at 12 p.m. on Fridays on talkradio.nyc. Very cool. When we come back, my interview with Macy Gray. 
Introducing the Mainstream, created by Michael Dolce, Talent Caldwell, Tony Moy, and Darren Sanchez. It tells the story of an interdimensional police force, polices alternate realities, keeps bad guys from other worlds from getting into ours. Issue 5, in stores now. Order it at your local comic book store or go to mikebooks.com slash store. This is Michael Dolce, host of Secrets of the Sire radio show and podcast. And welcome to our Patreon launch event. To date, we've interviewed actor Kevin Bacon and rocker Chris Cornell. We spent a wacky week with a real housewife and put love it or shove it with a comic book icon. We've debated which TV shows everyone should be watching and channeled our inner force comparing Rogue One to The Force Awakens. And that's the beginning. Become an executive producer and get an exclusive feed inside our studio before and while we air. Become a program director and receive our exclusive show outline with insider details on topics and guests hours before we go live. Or just be a fan. For a quarter of broadcast, we'll sing our phrases on the interwebs every week. So like pop culture, movies, TV shows, and graphic novels, this is the Patreon page for you. Join us Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern, Secrets of the Sire. Welcome back to Secrets of the Sire. Again, we do this every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, talkradio.nyc, and streaming live on facebook.com slash secrets of the sire. Um, very cool stuff that we got going on right now. Um, was able to do – this is a 1999 party, so that's what it's all about. Um, I was able to should actually, have Prince on, but he's he's not with us anymore. No, yeah, we can't really do that because that just won't work. Because, uh, but but I, I understand the sentiment. <laughs> very, we can't talk to the afterlife yet. Right? Very accurate, <laughs> accurate sentiment. So uh, if we could, I would, but we can't. Um, I actually have. <laughs> I remember that. Excuse me for for one second. I sure. remember that song. I remember being in a sleepaway camp and uh, the counselors playing the the 1999 song. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, they were talking about how awesome it is. Now it's an incredible song. You know, we had we had uh, these these music enthusiast counselors who were younger than you and I are right now. So it's, but they seem like so old to us. And I just remember. At that moment, that's that's burning in my brain. 1999, it seemed like it was a thousand years in the future. I thought I was going to be like. 50 years old by the time 1999 came along. Yeah. And now it's 20 years ago. <laughs> 1999 <sighs> is 20 years ago. It I know. It's I know. insane. I know. That is it's it, absolutely it, insane. It, it, it definitely makes um, makes me sad. <laughs> it just makes me sad. I think there's only there's well, no the other 90s way to describe was a, it. was a great time. It really was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to anybody who doesn't like nostalgia. I'm not a nostalgia hound. You're the not. It was a great, it was a great, great time. Music and, and, and movies and stuff like that, as we just said. So yeah. I do miss them. No, I agree. I agree. All right. Well, I got a great guest. Uh, she broke out in 1999. Uh, she does amazing things. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to give you Miss Macy Gray. All right, terrific. So I have Macy Gray with me. Uh, Macy, uh, the new album sounds really, really fresh. Uh, you know, f- you, you've been in this business now. You're, you're a veteran. Uh, but it comes across to me as you're, you're just as inspired and, and as invigorated as ever. Um, would that, is, is that a fair description of, of going into this new record? Oh, yeah. I'm over the moon. Very excited. What was uh what was it like going into into recording? You know, what was the inspiration behind these new songs? Just uh, I, I was I was I was in a studio with uh, okay, so we had three different producers, seven, a few actually not that many writers, maybe a few writers, and um, I mean when you're in the studio, it's all about what everybody's going through, with, every, with what everybody's mind at the time, and then um. Sometimes it all comes together and you get a song out of it, you know. So that's really, just, you know, what was going on in my life at the time and what I was feeling and things I was thinking about and things I was trying to figure out. So, but that's pretty much been the inspiration for all my albums. Okay, uh, so take me through like a song like White Man. Uh, that's actually, you know, it's 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 great that you. 
uh, brought you know bring up things that are going on in your mind. Uh, I thought it was a very provocative song, but it was also uh, a very you know it was just very contemporary and very you know going along with the with the the times right now. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, definitely inspired by our president mm-hmm. and um, well, everybody else's president. Okay, <laughs> but, um, um, I just I, it was it was just it was, it was just the the climate at the time of of how he was kind of um, promoting you know just divisive things you know mm-hmm. sexism and racism and everything so it was just a statement on it's not the 1960s anymore and we're not just gonna sit back but I'm very disappointed in you know my congress and actually all of us because I, I don't know how long like we're gonna sit back and say oh what's he gonna do today or oh mm-hmm. my god I can't believe he said that I don't know like, well when do we all say enough is enough and we have to really really bad so I'm just you know hoping that um you know we can all come together and you know actually do something about it because it's all opinion and complaints right now you know yeah and all this stuff is happening and no one's really doing anything so it's um it's, I'm just kind of disappointed in, in everything as far as our government and 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 this, you know just us as, as people and how we're, how we're dealing with with what we're going through no, that, I, yeah. no, I haven't done much about it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're busy touring and making records. I mean, it's, you know, we all got to live our lives, too. I guess that's the uh, that's the double-edged sword with that, right? Yeah, well, I want to make people happy and inspire people. And, and so hopefully my songs do that. So you're right, that, that's my contribution. But I want to do more, you know. I don't want to be just another one who sits back and is upset about it. That's all I'm saying. It makes sense. It makes sense. So let's talk about some more of the uplifting tunes. Then uh, we don't have to get as political here. Um, you know, uh, "Sugar Daddy" and "Overview" over you um, are are two of the singles out right now. Uh, walk me through both of those. I know "Sugar Daddy" was was uh, co-written by Megan Megan Trainer. How did that come about? And uh, and talk me talk to me about that collaboration. Uh, she was in my studio. I mean, it's not my studio. We were at the same studio, and she and she popped into my room, and she and she told me she had this big idea for me. And it turned out to be Sugar Daddy, and we wrote it that night. I think, I think we finished it the next morning. It was one of those things that just kind of went, you know. Mm-hmm. She's 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 a beautiful girl. She's fun. She's like very excited, and uh, she has a lot of ideas. I think she's gonna be. I think she's gonna be the new Carol King if she keeps if she keeps going. Yeah, no, that's a great it's a great comparison yeah. too. I um, I'm sure she would appreciate that. Um, you're, uh, talk to me about Over You as well, too. What's the uh, inspiration behind? Uh, was there something uh, going on in your life that, that kind of inspired this song? And, and I feel like a few others on the record, too. Over You is about the day you realize that, you know, that you're in love. Like, you love somebody. Like, everything that day, like that moment, you look at somebody and you say, oh, my God, you know? So, ah, okay, okay. It's huge, though. That's a huge record. It's, it's a massive record. It's, it's just Time, it just needs a few more months. Everybody's gonna be seeing that record. Yeah, no, it, very catchy. I can't believe I'm the one doing it. <laughs> Do you get like that in the studio? Is there, is there, um, you know, are there songs that you, you just kind of know? I, I, I interviewed um, this band called Everclear, and um, when they first broke out in 1996, he said, you know, we were playing some songs, and there's just something about a hit song where you just kind of know it. Um, you know, was there any th- any any of those feelings when you were recording any of these new songs that you just kind of knew it? No, not not really. I don't. I don't remember having one of those moments. I just know "Over You" makes people happy. It's 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 like it's just people light up when they hear it. I'm I'm just going by reaction. Yeah. And then, and then it's it's just it's just um. You know, it's like it's building up every day. It's like it has that that motion up, upward. You know, it's just going well. It has that feeling. You know. Mhm. But when I first heard it, no, I didn't. I thought, I mean, I liked it and I wrote it and I was hoping. But, yeah. But no, I don't sit in the studio and say that's a hit. No. Okay. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's it's it's funny because that's actually what uh, what. Uh, 
what the lead singer said. He said when he was playing it out, that's when he just knew people would, would just remember it and they just knew it. So it sounds like you actually did have the same kind of thing, just not in the studio, but out playing it, I guess, right? Yeah, just after playing it, like, that's the one everybody sings to, like, you know, like, they mention my album, they'll say, they'll say, oh my God, like, black, white, Asian, mom, dad, kids, mm-hmm. crazy. It has that, you know, that vibe, like, it's gonna make it to the top. So, um... I have a writer friend of mine, and he begged me. He had he because he knew I was going to interview, and he said uh, he needs me to. A- I, he said ask her about as told by Ginger, uh, the theme song, and and about the show. So how did you get involved in that, and and the theme song, and 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 writing, and and just being involved in the show? Oh, so um, they just it was one of those things that just landed in my lap, and uh, I don't know, went in and I cut it, and like in two takes. <laughs> I love it because it's such a simple song. It's just like, it's, and it, tells, it has this huge message, which I love. Cause she says, somebody told me the grass is much greener on the other side. And then there's blah, blah, blah. And then it goes, from where I'm standing. Wait, what did she say? Well, from where I'm standing, the grass is green. So it's like, you know, this message of how you always want more things. But then you, you look around and you already got what you got. Yep. I mean, you already got what, you, what you're looking for. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. But it's like a 30-second song, 30-second kid song, and it's just such a powerful message to, to put out there. And, and they did it in 30 seconds on, on a cartoon. So I, I love that song. I, I really appreciate you know being a part of that. Well, you, you have uh, you have many many fans more than just even children who might have watched the show. Uh, you have uh, adults who are big fans apparently, so it's it's a it's a great thing. You've done a lot of of TV work, a lot of uh, you know just just you know in in addition to being uh, a uh, you know a music star, you're you're in a way you've you, you've done a lot of film you have a lot of film credits, television credits, and things in general. Um, what are the ones that stand out to you? What's uh, what are some of the um, you know your TV or, or film experiences or even just like you said writing the theme song for something that that gets that kind of stands out in your mind mm, probably the first time i was on a movie set with denzel and that was huge and then i did idle wild with the outcast and um i, w- I wrote um, i think three um what do you call them what's the big the big slot you try to get in a movie, the end theme, or what is it called? I forgot. Uh, I, guess I don't just... know, but you know, it's a big deal to get the song that runs over the credits. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, I did three songs. Yeah, I know there's a word. I just, for some reason, it's, it's clipping my mind. But there's a, uh, I've written three, three uh, end songs just for Tony Scott, who I loved and uh-huh. I missed. And, um, but he used to, like, bring me in just to do it. So that was a, a huge honor, and uh, I don't know, all, all of them were cool. I just did a horror movie. That was my first horror movie, so all of them had their own little, like you know, milestone or whatever. They mm-hmm. were all, they were all super cool. What's the name of the film? Phobias. Oh, okay. Is uh, any any release date or or coming out next year? I guess sometime. Um, I know she's in editing, so it's definitely next year. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they have a date yet. I know they sold it because it was an independent um, movie, and I know they sold it without even having to go to a festival, which is awesome. So That's great. I think it'll be good. It's, a, it's actually a, a really well written, really good. Like I haven't seen the whole movie, but it, the way they did it was was really great. It's a first time director. She's only a girl. She's only twenty seven. Wow. People will talk about it. Wow, that's terrific. Uh, what was it like being on Dancing at the Stars? Uh, it was my nightmare. <laughs> it was, actually, when, when I was prepping, I had fun. Because um, we had, I had to, because they, they bring a camera crew with you, so you can't be like, you can't cheat and be lazy, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, we had to rehearse like four to six hours a day. So I'm dancing four to six hours almost every day and mm-hmm. I lost 25 pounds wow like 25 pounds in six weeks I was eating pizza <laughs> drinking every night and it just came off so that was <laughs> the best part of it <laughs> <laughs> and after that all the fun stuff ended <laughs> oh no 
that was it. No, it's it's a great it's a great show. Just I'm not a really good dancer, and they kind of dissed me. It was okay, but I but I love to lose and all that weight. I should do it again just to get the weight off. <laughs> well, it sounds good. It sounds like a a good uh, diet for me. I I I, would, I think I need that as well. Um, so uh, you had a cameo in the original Spider-Man film uh, about that experience. And then just in general, are you a big fan of the comic book movies? I mean, they're everywhere now. Is that something that, you know, um, that that you keep a close eye on? What, what was the last question? Uh, is that something that you, you know, are, are, are you a big fan of all the comic book movies that are, I mean, it's, you know, it's funny because you were in the original Spider-Man and that was one of the very early uh, comic book movies that before the... Oh, you, comic book. Yeah, before it really, before it really took off, before all you know the the, the you know now I mean ev- there's a comic book movie every three months you know in the in the in the theater. Um, so just take me back to that original experience with Spider Man and just let me know is that something you know are you a big fan of that genre or are you still like you know do you, are you a Marvel junkie do you do you, do you still like watch all this stuff? Mm, I don't think I'm a junkie compared to. Real junkies. I'm a I'm a huge Batman fan. I love Batman. I love the Joker. Wow. I love all the Batmans, like even the ones everybody hated on. I love Batman. <laughs> and I loved all the Jokers. <laughs> and all the Batmobiles. So that's really honestly the only one I really follow. Spider Man's cool and Superman's whatever, but I I always just loved Batman. And you know, I love saying like holy Batman. You know, holy smokes, Batman. <laughs> holy clean your room, Batman. Like, that's, <laughs> nah, it's, it's just fun. And then, uh, but doing Spider-Man was cool. I got to work with, uh, uh, on a huge set. That was, like, the most expensive set I had been on. And it was, it was cool that he, the director just turned out was a fan of mine. And, and they needed a band to perform while, while the goblin flew over. And he picked me, so I was super flattered, you know. Yeah. It was, it was Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, what's next for you? I mean, uh, you know, it's 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 great. I mean, you have 20 years in this business now, um, and you know, at this point, you know, you're you're very well established. Uh, you know, what's what's what are the what's the next mountain for you to climb? Um, tons of them. I want. I want to. I'm, I'm. I'm slowly making my way into television and. Uh, Talking about a a new a couple of new shows and with with some really creative and successful people and then um, of course my my records um, I'll probably be one of those who's on stage when I'm eighty yeah you know, and I'm 80. but I, but I love making albums I, I can't imagine giving that up or or performing and um and what else I got kids so my record is all over the place. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Michael Dolce for the Secrets of the Sire radio show and podcast, and welcome to our Patreon launch event. To date, we interviewed actor Kevin Bacon and rocker Chris Cornell. We spent a wacky week with a real housewife and played love it or shove it with a comic book icon. We debated which TV shows everyone should be watching and channeled our inner force for comparing Rogue One to The Force Awakens. And that's just the beginning. Become an executive producer and get an exclusive feed inside our studio before and while we air. Become a program director and receive our exclusive show outline with insider details on topics and guests hours before we go live. Or just be a fan. And for a quarter of broadcast, we'll sing your praise on the interwebs every week. So if you like pop culture, movies, TV shows, and graphic novels, this is the Patreon page for you. Join us Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern, Secrets of the Sire. Yeah. Welcome back to Secrets of the Sire. We do this every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, talkradio.nyc. Uh, my sunglasses have come off because, quite frankly, it's just it's just too much. Uh, we do this every... Too cool for school. Every Wednesday night, we go spinning the rack. We talked earlier about um, 
the Matrix versus Star Wars, and I actually found what I thought was actually a pretty darn cool um, uh, Matrix Star Wars connection. That's right. They're connected. I don't know how, but this guy on BuzzFeed found it, and it's it's really crazy. Uh, so blue pill, red pill connection. Uh, which one would a Jedi choose? We have the answer. Hassan, we have the answer. Uh, no, according to BuzzFeed, two years ago, Redditor the Robert Tamiz, Robert Tismo, Tismo, made an amazing discovery watching Attack of the Clones. Early on in the movie, Obi Wan and Anakin wind up in the Outlander Club on Coruscant as they're pursuing Zam Wassell, the assassin who just made an attempt on Padme's life. Obi Wan ultimately approaches the bar where a man offers to sell him death sticks. It's a relatively forgettable moment in the midst of the dramatic scene. However, the death stick dealer is played by an actor named Matt Doran. Uh. Mouse. Matt Doran, you might recognize him from The Matrix because he was a member of the Nebuchadnezzar crew and the designer of the woman in the red dress. You remember the mm. woman in the red dress, right? Yeah. Well, is, m- moments after – oh, uh, you can comment on that. It's fine. His character was named Mouse. Yes. I, I do remember, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have another one. Okay. <laughs> Well, right. hang on, we're, we're not done yet. But wait, yeah, we're, when you're, when you're we're not done, done yet. You're done. Moments you're after done. Matt Doran tries to sell Kenobi death sticks, it cuts to this woman who shows an apparent interest in Anakin Skywalker. It's not just any woman. That's Fiona Johnson, the exact same actor who plays the woman in the red dress. Also, no. notice the red and blue drinks. Given what we now know, would it be a stretch to suggest this is a reference to the red and blue pills? Uh, the Redditor... Made, who made this discovery believes it displays how a Jedi might not be as distractible as, say, Neo, who does take the bait. He goes on to point out that it could also illustrate Anakin's love for obsession with Padme, a recurring theme throughout the movie, or perhaps oh, wow. the entire Star Wars universe is just another bit of a simulated reality, a long-forgotten line of code buried deep within the Matrix. Another part of the Matrix. What's your, what's your Matrix Star Wars connection? The train man in the third Matrix movie. Mm-hmm. When Neo found when Neo was in the Matrix, although he didn't know how he got into the Matrix, he was stuck in the train sure. in, the, in the subway. The train man is also play, also played an alien in in uh, Revenge of the Sith, oh. he, and he's and he's also he was also the mouth of Sauron, even though that scene was cut out of uh, okay. Lord of the Rings, and he was also the he's very famous for being the aviator pilot in uh, the War- Road Warrior. Oh, okay. All right. So that's that's the same. I, I think his name is something Spence. Bruce Spence, I think his name is. But don't quote me. <laughs> but he's very famous. I didn't I didn't look it up because I thought that was the connection because I know that he was because I always I made it a I made a point of he was in all three of the of the the blockbuster yeah. trilogies of yeah. that time. He was in the Star Wars. He was in uh, Lord of the Rings, and he was in the Matrix. Okay. And, so and- yeah. But this one, and yeah, here's yours the thing is, too. Yours is a lot more, uh, a lot more intricate. I'll send you the link. Check out the photos that go along with I'm it, or just, just gonna go watch, or just go watch Attack. Well, but see, I, I don't want you to do that because Attack of the Clones is very bad. Uh, it's not a good movie. It's, it's, it's possibly my. It, it is not possibly. It is the worst Star Wars film that has ever been made. And yes, worse than Last Jedi. Well, well, all right. Well, maybe not. But it is the second you're, to last worst you're, you're Star Wars only movie. Talking. It You're is only talking second, to yourself right now. Second to last verse. <laughs> so don't watch it, but go check it out. Uh, Obi Wan, I'm, I'm think... gonna go. I'll go watch it, and uh, and I'll I'll see if I can see the these these characters. You present. definitely will, because Obi Wan drinks the blue drink when all is said and done. Yeah, because he doesn't want to wake up. That's it. That's it. That's what it's all about. Would you want right. to wake up if you knew all the Jedi were going to get killed? Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, yeah, you put it that way. <laughs> uh, this one's for you, my man. Um, this is Deadwood confirmed for spring oh, yeah. 2019 release. Let, tell me tell me about Deadwood. Why is Dead? What, what's what's the deal here? What's so big about this? Did it end like uh, on a Deadwood's... cliffhanger or something? Uh, in, in a way, in a way it did. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't. Um it ended with a resolution, but it wasn't a it wasn't a full resolution. This main bad guy had come into the town. He was doing all, all sorts of terrible things to people. And at the end of the third season, spoiler, spoiler, he left the town. Okay. And they never got back at him. They never they never beat him. Okay. They never got him. But he did leave the town. So it wasn't like a cliffhanger. Like you know, he he wasn't holding a, a an axe over someone's head and then they faded to black and you never knew what happened. 
But uh, Deadwood is just this amazing uh, show about this uh, this illegal uh, gold rush town in in the in the in the Black Hills, sure. uh, in the in the Dakotas back in uh, I don't know eighteen I think eighteen seventy something. I, I do not know the exact uh, year. Okay. But I mean, uh, and it's it's a real historical place. You can actually go to Deadwood mm-hmm. uh, now. And uh, David Milch, who's a, just an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, writer, mm-hmm. uh, television show producer, who wrote uh, Hill Street Blues and wrote NYPD Blue okay. and, and a number of other shows. He he wrote Deadwood. He he pitched a he pitched a show about Rome to uh, HBO, and HBO's like, oh, we already got a Rome show, David. So thanks. <laughs> so he goes, uh, okay. So what if I made it in Deadwood? Well, I got this. And, what do you think? Yeah, exactly. And he 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 always uh he always says that's a testimony to being prepared when you go yeah. to these meetings with a pitch and then you have a counter pitch. Yeah. So, um, and and it, it was the just, writing. It was a, it was a big ext- fan following, though, right? I mean, it's it, it was it was, those... it, it, it was huge, um, but it was very expensive. Um, I guess it wasn't. It didn't justify the cost. Yeah. Um, and it, I think also there was a regime change at H- HBO. Where uh, where the people came in didn't believe in it. Yeah. So they they got rid of it. They they it's one, it's on a list of things that the HBO executives said they shouldn't have canceled. But it, <laughs> it came many years later. Who who, who cares? There's you know? always that. All right. Well, I want to thank our guests, Joan and Priya. Check them out. Talkradio.nyc on Follow Me Friday. Uh, I also want to give a happy big happy birthday to my son celebrating his third birthday. He's huge. He's awesome. Love my life. I love him so much. And my wife's birthday is tomorrow which means I get off the hook with Valentine's Day uh, and a birthday being combined into one. Your wife's birthday is on Valentine's Day? That is correct, sir. So uh, is my mom's. Oh. That's that's uh, that's very interesting. Very that's strange. Very, yeah, that's odd. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Next week, <laughs> Alita, wacky. Battle Angel. Thanks, yeah, you guys. Please.